In the course of my work as an artist, I have boiled milk in a 100 degrees Celsius sulfur spring in the crater of an active volcano, transformed a mattress into an iceberg through embedding refrigeration coils in its springs, made a bathtub into a geyser, celebrated my birthday with a volcano born the same year, talked about rocks over coffee with geologists on the crest of an erupting volcano, formed sculptures in caves and hot springs, spent time with geology collections formed inside the body, and held the Allende meteorite, the oldest known object in the solar system, between my two hands. Within this talk, the images you will see are all drawn from these projects, as well as recent work as the artist curator of the geology collection in the Music Hall, the new Shrewsbury Museum and Art Gallery, and as the inaugural artist fellow at National Museums Scotland. <clears throat> My work explores the relationship between geological phenomena and daily life. Within my practice, drawing parallels between very personal events, for example, when I was born or when my father died with the birth of a volcano, allows for a space to think about our place within the geological time continuum from a more intimate perspective. My working approach combines field work in diverse locations, Hawaii, Iceland, France, China, and in museums, archives, and laboratories with an active studio-based practice. Through this cross-disciplinary context, a flexibility within my practice has developed. Aspects from one discipline are freely combined with another as and when the work requires. Drawing merges with stencil fabrication, printmaking with sculpture, text with casting, film with performance, art with geological processes. I have long-term collaborative engagement in fields, quote, out with a fine art context, from medicine and geoscience to archaeology, with a strong focus on geology in all its myriad forms. <clears throat> These collaborative approaches within my practice have grown organically out of the work itself and have led to subsequent unexpected ways of working, from field work alongside, alongside volcanologists and laser etching minerals in a print studio to wild caving with neuroscientists. In the development of new ideas, I've had the honor and pleasure of working with organizations such as the Global Volcanism Program, the British Geological Survey, Earthwatch, and the Berlin Medical History Museum. Through this process, I've had the opportunity to spend time with scientists of extraordinary creative vision in some of the most remarkable field locations on Earth. I have always embraced a non-prescriptive combination of close examination of the natural world and serendipitous discovery. As a teenager, I trained as a stone carver. Printmaking, lens-based media, drawing, and sculpture in their widest sense have increasingly become integral aspects of my practice, as whether carving infinitesimal lines out of hard ground for a copper plate etching or altering the surface of mica, my current working process feels greatly akin to the focus, physicality, and material richness involved with carving stone. Over the last few years, my ongoing interest in articulating our relationship to the geological world has manifested through physical geology, a project which explores our desire to make corporeal contact with geological phenomena. To describe, two encounters with museum collections that changed my understanding of the world. One, the discovery of a geological artifact in the Manchester Museum led to the realization 
that a cave can make art. While conducting research as an alchemy fellow at the Manchester Museum in the, quote, oddities drawer of the geology department, I came across a fine collection of lava medallions from Mount Vesuvius. Magma pressed between forged steel plates to form an imprint. Imagine a waffle iron that uses lava as batter. In the same drawer, a small stone relief sculpture appeared to be carved out of pure white alabaster. In fact, it was a limestone cast created, being created via the same process that forms stalactites in a cave. In revisiting these historical geological art processes, lava forging and cave casting, I began to develop ideas for physical geological artworks. Art objects formed within a geological or deep time context. In a small thermal town in the mountains of the Auvergne in France, seven generations ago, Eric Papon's family founded the Fontaine Petrifiante in Saint-Nectaire to create limestone sculptures limestone sculptures literally made by a cave. In a, norm, in a normal limestone cave, it takes 100 years for a stalactite to grow one centimeter. In the Fontaine Petrofiante, one centimeter grows in one year. Through an elaborate process, carbonate waterfalls are directed over 25 meter high casting ladders located inside a volcanic mountain. Eric places objects on the rung of each ladder. Quickly, objects become covered in a new layer of calcium carbonate. In 2008, we began to work together in the caves. The plan is to make a geological time diptych, new lava medallions, new cave casts, slow time and fast time alongside each other. To date, I've made a new series of cave casts which formed over the course of 10 months in the calcifying springs of the Fontaine Petrofiante. The last, the last casts were cracked open to coincide with my 36th birthday in September 2009. The slow time component of the project is now complete. Ancient and technologically advanced modes of production were employed to arrive at these unique objects of pure geology, including traditional copper plate etching, virtual modeling, rapid prototyping, and limestone incrustation. This limestone addition can be considered as a set of stone prints. In a volcanic prologue to the fast time component of physical geology, I spent time encountering active lava flows as they formed new land on Big Island, Hawaii. To complete the project, lava stamping implements are ready and waiting for a molten river to emerge from another volcano, Etna, where the art of lava forging surfaced. To carry out this action, volcanologists have agreed to work together at the edge of the next flow. This may occur in one moment or within a lifetime. Two, a museum collection of an entirely unexpected nature. One evening in Edinburgh, someone approached me and said, I have been thinking about your work lately. I came across something that I think you might be very interested in. It's a collection of body stones. Body stones? Body stones. Gall stones, kidney stones. They are all made of geology. Out of this conversation grew a totally unexpected line of inquiry within my work. The idea that we as humans are also geological agents. We form geology. We are like volcanoes, producing new landmass on a micro scale. The boundary between the biological and the geological can begin to blur. Over the course of two years, I developed a large scale project comprised of sister exhibitions at the Berlin Medical History Museum 
and the Schering Stiftung in Berlin, both of which opened in January 2012. We focused on body stones and their relationship to new landmass of a cultural and geological nature. The exhibition combined an in-depth collection of my work shown alongside historical geological artifacts, including body stones, ancient meteorites, and lava bombs on loan from historical medical and geological collections in Germany and Scotland. To prepare for this project, I spent time with two collections of body stones, both in the Berlin Medical History Museum, as part of research for the exhibition Steine, both the German word for stones and a very common Jewish last name, which I quite liked as an Eastern European diaspora Jew working in Berlin. One is a historical collection of stones from the 1700s excavated by Johann Gottlieb Walter and Friedrich August Walter, a father and son team of body mineralogists. The second collection is contemporary and belongs to Navina Vidulin, the Medical Museum Preparator. Encountering Navina's collection on display in her laboratory, you would think you were looking at shelves of precious gems and minerals. She, she began her collection of body stones in the mid-1990s. Now, surgeons and pathologists throughout Germany send her stones in the post whenever they extract, some, extract one from someone living or dead. In the body, each stone is a biological entity. Once out of the body, it belongs to the realm of geology. A body stone is a new territory, a miniature planet traveling through an interior universe, new landmass. We should name stones as we name stars, each one in memory of someone close. I had a memory of seeing a cross section of an old pipe in the geology collection of the Hunterian Museum in Glasgow. It's about a foot wide though you can hardly see through it, as a thick geothermal mineral deposit formed inside like the start of a clogged geological artery. Building on earlier investigations into the formation of culturally occurring landmass, I began working on a new series of geothermally occurring sculptures. These geological artworks formed through the deep Arctic winter over the course of two Point five weeks time in the 80 degrees Celsius mineral rich waters of the Blue Lagoon, <coughs> an active geothermal spring in Iceland. <coughs> With the help of Hannes Johansson, I submerged wooden stencils into the runoff pool from the geothermal power plant which feeds the Blue Lagoon. There, the sculptures rapidly <coughs> encrusted in a new silica mineral deposit over this period of formation. The library, recent encounters in geology, mineralogy, and with corals and mollusks in National Museums, Scotland. Rocks are records of events that took place at the time they formed. They are books. They have a different vocabulary, a different alphabet, but you learn how to read them. John McPhee. For years, the skyscrapers in New York were firmly planted in Midtown and down at the end of the island, not by choice, but because there the dense pegmatite-rich rock was exposed at the surface. Mica schist, strong enough to hold the weight of towers. This same type of rock inhabits the coast of Maine, vast areas of Scotland, and Riverside Park along the Hudson. As a kid growing up on the East Coast, from New York to New England, I know mica from streets that glinted in the sun, playgrounds peopled by boulders that seemed made of silver and gold, rocks on the beach with layers you could peel open like the pages of a book. Peter Davidson, Q 
curator of minerals and, me and meteorites at National Museums, told me every mineral sample of mica is termed a book. My mother remembers finding books of mica in the alley next to the building where she grew up in Brooklyn. Edgar Allan Poe lived across from Riverside Park when he is rumored to have written The Raven. If you find a stone in the area and leave it on the granite plaque on West 83rd Street, your book of mica becomes part of a memorial to the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. I imagine all these volumes together, a library composed of only rocks and minerals, every layer another narrative. In May, an exhibition entitled The Library will open at National Museum Scotland. In the run-up to the show, I have been etching books of mica, sourcing a 400 million year old piece of Scottish marble made from the first moments of organic life and forming new sculptures in the Fontaine Petrofiante, which resemble bones, coral, fingers. When I turned 30, I found a crystal shard on the slopes of the Eldfell volcano, celebrating our simultaneous appearance in 1973. Upon return this past summer, marking almost a decade more of life, I happened upon agates which emerged from the lava in 1973. In the library, these agates feature alongside objects formed when two unlikely forces come together across time and space, from tectites formed in a split second to mollusks that build their shells over the course of a lifetime. There will also be a reading room, a space to read rocks and think about our place within the geological continuum. Shropshire's Great Journey. For the past few years, I've been working with Adrian Plant and the geology and design teams in Shrewsbury, the birthplace of Charles Darwin, to develop the Hall of Rocks and Minerals, the new home for the museum's geology collections. Through this process, I asked the artist Ian Gardner to develop a hand-drawn animation which visualizes the story of Shropshire's 600, mi 600 million year geological journey and approach Nicola White an author who is based in Argyle, to write a textual journey through each of Shropshire's ancient paleo environments, inviting visitors to imagine landscapes of the mind which are now long past, but still beneath your feet. As a child, one of the main places that I went exploring and adventuring was the American Museum of Natural History in New York, specifically the Hall of Minerals and Gems. In 1976, the hall had just been redeveloped and reopened. It had been built to mimic the interior of a cave. In this way, long before I started carving stone or working in relation to geology, I had this unadulterated primary experience of being in a beautiful space where all these incredible, mysterious objects were glittering in the dark. In the hall, you could explore and discover things, clamber over huge chunks of copper and jasper. The hall was actually designed to make you want to climb all over it. The museum wanted, children's, wanted children and adults to interact with the geology. In an article I found about the reopening of gems and minerals, they said they wanted people to, quote, touch these specimens, put their arms around them, fall in love with them. Okay, very 70s in the language around it. But I guess you could say that I'm a case study for the success of their redesign because I fell in love with rocks. And the hall absolutely had a huge impact on my development as a human being. Now, in our hall of rocks and minerals, we will not try to replicate my early wanderings in natural history. But you could say that we hope to encourage a love of rocks and minerals, and that if even one person decides, decides to find out more about geology, that would be our aspiration as well. 
I will also contribute a series of new geological artworks to the geology collection that have formed over the duration of the project. Cave sculptures formed in the Fontaine Petrofiante will accompany trace fossils in deserts and lakes, a diptych of geothermally occurring artworks for volcanoes, and for estuaries and floodplains, a sentence encrusted in limestone in a stream near Oswestry, first spoken by Darwin, not all so long ago. I distinctly recollect the desire I had of being able to know something about every pebble in front of the hall door. End notes. Needless to say, I take a lateral approach to working with collections. I don't worry about what I will produce when initially invited to respond to a new constellation of material. I let chance encounters with objects and the individuals who know those objects well guide the working process. As to the objects, just as encountering a body stone can complicate your understanding of what is animal, vegetable, mineral, or somewhere in between, so too do the ways we categorize those objects. Should a body stone live in a drawer in the geology department, or should it continue to reside in the anatomy museum? Hopefully, it is part of our role as artists engaging with collections to raise these questions, complicate categories further, shift our expectations around what an object is or can be. I have become increasingly interested in agitating and slightly reassembling the geological record, incorporating body stones, cave casts, and many other now unknown geological encounters into the deep time story. Thank you.